Welcome to Vintage SF. I'm Richard Rempel. Today, we're going to conclude our series on the Science Fiction Hall of Fame, Volume 1, Short Stories, from 1929 to 1964. These are stories that were voted on by the Science Fiction Writers of America after they formed in 1965. This is their way of honoring 26 stories prior to the awarding of the Nebula Awards. In part one, I gave you an introduction to the book, and we looked at six stories. In part two, I looked at 10 stories. And here in part three, we'll look at the final 10 stories and have a conclusion. So let's get started. Coming Attraction by Fritz Leiber appeared in the November 1950 issue of Galaxy Science Fiction. It had a beautiful cover by Paul Calais. The story is set in Manhattan during a long war between the Soviet Union and United States. A nuclear bomb has destroyed Midtown. In perhaps an underestimation of what this could do to Manhattan, we do have the story set in North Manhattan. Our protagonist is Weston Turner, a British citizen who's come to New York to barter for grain. In exchange, he's giving them electronic equipment, which he suspects is going to be used on an American moon base. This moon base would be used to launch attacks on the Soviet Union. But this is all background. The main story occurs on the streets of Manhattan when he rescues a woman from being run over by a car. The car has hooks on it and pulls her skirt off. It appears that war-torn U.S. has gone very conservative. In fact, women's faces are covered. We learn more about this alternate type reality as we go into the story and we discover that there is deception in a number of different ways, including psychological. Fritz Leiber work has a strong sense of setting in his story. In this weird Manhattan setting of World War III, we come to realize that masks occur in different ways. I think for many readers, Leiber is polarizing. You either hate or love his stories. The Quest for St. Aquin by Anthony Boucher First published in the book New Tales of Space and Time, 1951. In a post-apocalyptic, technocratic earth, religion has been banned and the Catholic Church has gone underground. Our protagonist is a priest named Thomas who's charged by the secret pope to find the resting place of a semi-legendary figure called Aquin. According to legend, Aquin spoke with great power and converted all those who listened to him. His body supposedly never rotted after his death. The pope believes and hopes that this miracle, if true, will be a powerful tool in winning new converts. Thomas is provided with a robotic transportation device called a robass, robotic ass, to assist him in finding a Quinn's body. This story encompasses their arguments and their journey. Of course, this reminded me of another famous story, A Canticle for Leibowitz by Walter M. Miller Jr. It seems that post-apocalyptic Catholics is a subgenre of its own. The highlight of the story for me were the conversations between Thomas and Robas. You may be surprised by the ending to this story. Surface Tension by James Blish was first published in the August 1952 issue of Galaxy Science Fiction. I love this cover. A human colonization ship crash lands on a planet. Its only landmass is covered with shallow puddles of water and microscopic life forms. Since they cannot survive here, they genetically engineer their descendants into something that can survive. They create a race of microscopic aquatic humanoids. Generations later, these aquatic ancestors of theirs seek to break the surface tension and see the space above the puddle that they're in. This is a fascinating story of world building and discovery. What would it be like to have what seems like an impenetrable sky. And if you broke through, what would you find? The Nine Billion Names of God by Arthur C. Clarke first appeared in Star Science Fiction Stories, an anthology that was published February 1953. On a side note, this became a series of books 
and are well regarded. I remember first reading this story when I was in middle school, and this is the edition that I saw. It's a collection of Arthur C. Clarke short stories. In a Tibetan lamasery, the monks seek to list all the names of God. They believe that the universe was created for this purpose, and that once this naming is completed, God will bring the universe to an end. Three centuries ago, the monks created an alphabet in which they calculated they could encode all the possible names of God, numbering about nine billion. They were trying to write this out by hand, but now they are renting a computer capable of printing all the possible permutations. Two Westerners have been hired to install and program the machine. Will they be successful? And if they are, what, if anything, will happen after the nine billion names of God are printed out? When I first read this story in middle school, I thought it was the best science fiction story I had ever read. Obviously, the science fiction writers of America thought it was pretty good, too. And here is Star Science Fiction Stories number two with our next story. Just a note that the cover artist for both Star Science Fiction Stories anthologies is Richard Powers. The story is It's a Good Life by Jerome Bixby. Anthony Fremont is a three-year-old boy with unbelievable godlike powers. Everyone in his town is walking on eggshells for fear of what this boy could do to them. He can read their minds. He can transform people, and he can teleport as well. People are very careful what they think around Anthony. They want everything around Anthony to be good. This is a terrifying story that takes this premise further than we could even imagine. If it sounds familiar to you, it became an episode of The Twilight Zone in 1961. You may also recognize the name Jerome Bixby, as he wrote a number of original Star Trek episodes, including Mirror Mirror, Day of the Dove, Requiem for Methuselah, and By Any Other Name. The Cold Equations is a story by Tom Godwin, first published in Astounding Magazine, August 1954. A small emergency dispatch ship is launched from the interstellar cruiser Stardust to deliver desperately needed medicine to the frontier world Woden. The EDS pilot, Barton, soon discovers a stowaway, 18-year-old Marilyn Lee Cross. This emergency dispatch ship has limited fuel. It's been calculated on the precise weight of the medicine and pilot. Marilyn has thrown this equation out of sync. Fondly Fahrenheit by Alfred Bester first published in the August 1954 issue of the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction. James Vandeleur and his multiple aptitude android are fleeing a world. They are fleeing the murder of a young child. This is a story of an insane murderous personality. But is it the man or the android? Alfred Bester produced some of his best work in the 1950s. Tiger Tiger, also known as the Star is My Destination, and The Demolished Man. Fondly Fahrenheit fits in with these two novels. This is another one of those hard-scrabble, hard-nosed Alfred Bester stories. It's not for the weak of heart, and it plays tricks with you as you try to determine what is happening and why the temperature at the time of the murders is important. Or is it? The Country of the Kind by Damon Knight, first published in the February 1956 issue of the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction. The story is set in a future world in which violence and crime have been almost entirely eradicated. The main character is a criminal capable of antisocial behavior. He thinks of himself as the king of the world. But in a world that has excommunicated him, we discover how shallow his life is. Is his punishment kind or unbearably cruel? Flowers for Algernon by Daniel Keyes was first published as a short story in the April 1959 issue of the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction. It was expanded upon and published as a novel in 1966. Algernon is a laboratory mouse who has undergone surgery to increase his intelligence. The story is told in a journal or progress reports by a Charlie Gordon, a human subject 
chosen for this experiment. The first reports look like they are written by a very young elementary school student. There are both grammatical and spelling mistakes within it. But these reports are charming. Charlie Gordon is a good man. As the experiment continues, Keyes takes us on a journey through these progress reports. We see the English and spelling improve. We hear of progress in Charlie's life. We see him become very intelligent. And we see him become aware of how he's been treated in his former simple life. Things take a complicated turn when Algernon, the mouse, becomes ill. What happens if Algernon dies? Will Charlie regress? Will he die too? The last story is A Rose for Ecclesiastes by Roger Zelazny, published in the November 1963 issue of the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction. You may have noticed that that magazine has figured prominently in this episode. In the previous two episodes, we saw Astounding Magazine dominate. Now, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction has come into its own. And take a look at this special wraparound cover painting for the story by Hans Bach. If you collect SF magazines, this is a very important issue. The story is narrated by a gifted human linguist and poet named Gallinger. He's part of a mission studying Mars and becomes the first human to learn the high language of the intelligent Martians. He's been allowed to read their sacred texts. The Martian high priestess regards Gallinger highly, and over the course of months, his theological and poetical discussion elevate him to the status of something like a prophet. He translates the biblical book of Ecclesiastes, which he finds similar to their religious texts, into the high tongue of the Martians. He and the high priestess start a relationship. He promises to bring her a rose, since the Martians have never seen one. He discovers the fatalism of the Martians. They believe they are the last generation. But are they? Is he a prophet who can change things? This beautiful story is both literature and science fiction. It is about fatalism and hope. It's about faith. So I just want to make a few comments about the 10 stories that we've looked at today. All these stories are definitely worthy of being included in this anthology. Many of them elicited an emotional response. The ones that resonated with me most were The Nine Billion Names of God, Fondly Fahrenheit, Flowers for Algernon, and A Rose for Ecclesiastes. I think Clark's The Nine Billion Names of God, in a weird way, is a reversal of the story by Isaac Asimov, Nightfall. I think they would make a good companion piece in study. Alfred Bester's SF output in the 1950s is unparalleled by any other author. Not in quantity, but just in sheer audacity of writing. Fondly Fahrenheit takes you along for a brutal psychological journey with a man and his android. Flowers for Algernon is a warm, sensitive story. It asks each of us to think about how we treat others. And A Rose for Ecclesiastes takes us on a journey of fatalism, hope, and belief. It is an interesting mix of classical literature, biblical literature and theology, and hope. This concludes our look at the Science Fiction Hall of Fame Volume 1 short stories. I do plan to return to this series with Volume 2, Novellas, edited by Ben Bova. So which are your favorite stories from this video? Are there stories that you think should have been included in this collection, or perhaps excluded? Let me know in the comments below. Until next time, keep reading.